come back. Just go ahead. Hi, everybody. Uh, we are um, live uh, from Virtual Connecting and um, connecting with. Um, now, what's the official name for this conference? Who can let us, who who can let the audience know? Dealer. Dealer <laughs> is the conference name. And, uh, <laughs> the Learning Network. Digital Learning Network Conference, and we're joined um, by some on-the-ground um, buddies. Andrea, um, I wrote all these down and still mess up. <laughs> Lisa and Laura, did they get all three? So no. it's, I'm Andrea Wren <laughs> from Whittier College. This is Catherine Cronin. And, and Laura I'm Laura Gogia. Way better let people do their own introductions in the future. Yeah. <laughs> so why don't we go down the line and start um, with, well, from what's I'm going down, I'm going to start on stage left from my side. So with Maha. I'm Maha Bali from Egypt, and uh, I'm the co-founder of Virtually Connecting. And I just finished presenting, and Laura and Catherine were there. Oh, wow. <laughs> and next we have Lisa. I'm Lisa Chamberlain from Walla Walla, Washington, and uh, I was chasing hot air balloons this morning, uh, so I'm looking a little ragged. Um, I'm an e-learning director at a community college here. And it looks like you're in your office. I am in my office on a Saturday. <laughs> and uh, Jennifer? Hi, everyone. I'm Jennifer England, tuning in from Minnesota. And then Helen. Hi, I'm Helen DeWard, and I'm from the uh, central part of Ontario, Aurelia area, but I'm currently sitting in a hotel in Detroit. <laughs> wow. <laughs> okay. So um, I got to catch a little bit of the conference stream today um, in between um, getting things done around the house, and a, a kind of a takeaway I, I saw was this idea that there's the narrative of the non-traditional student bumping up against higher education and that I, there was one good takeaway that was quote was like well for these students of course like your job and your you know that academic first isn't always your priority so what do you guys see as you know with ideas with virtually connecting what do you um, see how how's that fit the non-traditional student in higher education hmm. That's interesting. does either of you want to jump in on that yeah, it's interesting that you pick up on that, Greg, because that was certainly the theme of that keynote, but I wouldn't say that it's been a theme of the conference so far. Okay. Right. That was the only thing I could catch this morning. So what would you, then let's start there. What, do you, let's, what does everyone think that the, because I know Laura had talked about, she has no idea what this conference is about. So yeah. what does everyone say this conference is about? What is the big theme that people have taken away to date? Let's start there then. Well, um, I've been thinking about it a lot, as you know, because I, I tend to tweet what I what I'm thinking about. And it seems to me that the theme or the word that I've heard the most is the word agency. Agency and identity and the intersection between the two. And yet, even though those are the words we're speaking, it may or may not be actually what's going on at the conference. And I want to, um, I'm unsure about that. Um, and it's something that I'm bringing up with people on an individual basis um, because there are certain narratives, such as the one that you bring up, the, the non-traditional student, um, that is popping up, like at the keynote this morning. And um, I was at a small presentation where it, it came up where one of the presenters was like, you in higher ed need to remember that 50% of the students are at community colleges and they are non-traditional and, and, sh and they were saying very, very much what was going on at the keynote this morning. Um, but that's not the common thread that, that we're hearing through the day. Um, so, I, I, yeah, I'm still trying to figure out what this conference is about, but I would say that the words that I've heard the most are agency and, um, agency and identity. <laughs> Is okay. That, yes. Yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. And for me, um, it just so happens that the work that I was sharing yesterday, I spoke yesterday morning here at the conference in, in one of the workshop sessions, um, that, and the title of my session was "Unpicking Binaries" and just mm -hmm. trying to to dig into some of the complexity around, you know, how we bandy around, you know, well, is it open or is it bounded? Is it online or is it offline? Um, you know, do you use social media or do you not social media? And of course, all the interesting things are in the, you know, complex blending that goes on there. And um, so I spoke about a small 
research study that I'm doing, but I'm hearing a lot of those words also at the conference around people trying to talk about um, moving beyond the binaries. The session that we were just in was, you know, postmodernism, metamodernism, you know, complexity, uh, the smackdown. We didn't hear the result of the smackdown. <laughs> Uh, but it was great because it raised a lot of issues. Uh, there's a lot of divergent thinking, actually, and I, I suppose that's what I expected. So I'm sitting through some of the sessions quite frustrated, mm -hmm. A, because, um, because of that divergent thinking, and B, because I'm from Ireland, and some of the, the foundational understandings that I, I hear people speaking on are about U.S. Mm -hmm. higher education, and, which is different to my model of higher education. So there's, an, there's another level of dissonance for me there, but um, you know, I'm not the only person who's out, from outside the U.S., so that's not unique to me. Um, I'm not really sure what's going to happen by the end of today, day two. I don't know if we hope to identify some overarching themes or directions in future conversations, or if we'll leave acknowledging the messiness. I'm not really sure. And, and I, I feel like in the, the midst of the struggle, uh, we see people falling back on the binaries and then other people calling them on it. Like the, the age-old faculty versus administrator binary. Um, it will pop up and then someone else will question it. And um, you know, I think that's kind of part of you know, when you're struggling, you're not always as careful. And, and, and so mm -hmm. your underlying assumptions just yeah. kind of rear their ugly heads. Yes. Um, so we are seeing that happen. Um, but, but agency and identity make divergency, and I found it, um, you said you found that frustrating, this idea of divergency, but it's almost like, isn't that where agency and identity come from, from diverging from something? Um, like, or, like, isn't, to me, it's like, I see this idea of divergence as a sense of, does, is that one establishing agency and identity in, in these kinds of, of spaces? And feel free, um, if you're you know, not an on-site buddy, to hop in at any time. Um, but I, I really like that idea, of course, agency and identity is how, in the literacy community, we often, often define, like, what's it mean, literacy? Um, but I'm stuck on this idea of, when you're talking about Catherine, this idea of that you found the divergency to be a little frustrating. What did you mean by that? Or did I misstate it, what you were saying? Yeah, yeah. yeah. see, the, the way I, I feel about it is that, the, and because I'm very frustrated as well, mm -hmm. okay? Um, and I come from a, a U.S. background, mm -hmm. um, and so I, I don't have the same mm -hmm. reason for being frustrated. I, I feel like um, there is divergence. There are different voices, uh, but there's unequal representation. And so I was having a conversation with someone else this morning about it and trying to work through my own feelings because I'm feeling very strong at this conference. Um, and, and they brought up the word token. Like it almost felt like there were, there were divergent, there was divergent thinking in the room, but not from enough people that it felt like equal representation. Um, and so somebody from one of these other perspectives or paradigms um, will speak up. And it's not that everyone in the room shoots them down or anything like that, um, but it, it doesn't get to go anywhere. And so there's divergent thought, and we haven't gotten to the place where then we can make a bridge or we can make something productive out of it or that it, it um, we haven't gone anywhere yet. And, and I'm like Catherine, I'm waiting to see what's going to happen because there's still time. And it's kind of one of those things where it, it might all turn around in the last 15 minutes of the conference and then suddenly it's, it's awful. So um, well, both I we're think a waiting stage. It's, it's really interesting for me that I don't think people generally go into conferences with expectations like that, but it seems that this particular conference had those expectations. I mean, I don't go to ET4 Online or the OLC conference wanting something new transformative to happen, right? Um, but I was I was going to ask two things, actually. So uh, the, the word token makes me smile a lot because I'm, so a lot of people joke about me being the token international in, in our, our sub-community of ed tech. So the kind of people that deal are, and I think I know pretty much everybody. I mean, Rebecca makes fun of me that not everybody else knows everybody, but I know almost everybody there. And, and having said that, all of you are in a certain 
dimension of uh, you're all thinking in a certain way. Within that way, there might be different voices, but the majority of you are thinking in that particular way. And that's why I'm surprised that Catherine is saying there was diversions, because I'm thinking that it seems to me more harmonious than divergent. I'm not seeing a dealer and snark hashtag, for example, <laughs> and that's like quite rare in a conference. And then, um, and also, uh, I lost a thought. Sorry, I mean, maybe you could respond to that first. Yeah, I'm not feeling the divergence in terms of uh, personally. What, what I'm um, what I'm experiencing is just um, the the kinds of starting points that people have are quite different, and um, so that's one thing. But the also, you know, Mike talked about Fed Wiki yesterday. You know, there are people here who have a lot of experience with Fed Wiki, and people that's very new to this. Very, very different um, reaction to that. Um, in Bloom, I missed his talk yesterday, but you know, he said his work, doing it one's own, the garden of one's own, is probably something that I've learned from Mike's talk. And I suppose what I'm experiencing is uh, we all have thought a lot about this problem space. And, um, we have come in here and we're, we, we've had to recognize that we are in different contexts, we have different starting points, we have different experience, and and perhaps that that's the difference, is that the expectation is that online we share a lot of the same values and that, you know, have some of similar conversations, but once you take the lid off and get into the detail, um, there's some you know, there's some dissonance there mm -hmm. and we're just wrestling with that. Right. And I think that's what this is all about, these two days. Right. Um, but it's, uh, you know, there's a lot of leaving sessions and thinking, oh, I really need to think about that, or I really need to talk to that person, and so on. Um, the good thing is that it's not a conference where there's a lot of, you know, techno-solutionism. You know, some conferences you go to and you go, here's another, here's another presentation on Google Glass, or this is how this worked in my classroom. There are no sessions about that. This is really raising the messy questions. So I guess it should feel awkward and difficult, because it is. The, the last tweet I read before I came in here was from Kate Bowles, and she's, she the themes that she's feeling are about um, holding risk and care together, and I think that makes a lot of sense for me. I'm not sure if that makes sense. I'm just really speaking of you know from where I am at this moment, coming out of the last session. Uh, I'd love to hear you know from anyone else who's here. Um, over on, it was more on, I think, Slack, but um, I had some great conversations with, um, well, I didn't know his name at the time, but uh, Paul Olivier, or Olivier, I'm going to butcher your name, Paul, sorry, uh, De Hay, um, just about the safe harbor rules, like stuff like European perspectives. I mean, that's one thing, um, you know, from an American and European perspectives and thinking about different ideas of privacy and freedom of speech yes. and all, all those issues. That's been so interesting to me to be able to make those connections in kind of a, a safe place. And, and Paul is, you know, explaining, I, I just didn't know. I mean, it's a very complicated issue. And he sat with me and, and um, through a series of, of discussions, I got to actually learn a lot about um, Safe Harbor and the EU and, and just the government structure that I just, I know nothing about. I honestly, I mean, you don't, you don't see the, the European Union covered in the U.S., I'll tell you that, that much. Um, yeah, and, and you see, it works the other way. From mm -hmm. Europe, we know a lot about the U.S. So yeah. You know, it's that, um, that, that, that different dynamic about power. I'm sure Maha will agree with that. You throw a binary in there, but uh, that was, you know, in a, in a sense. But it was more about opening that, that binary. And I mentioned this in the, the last uh, virtually connecting session. So I apologize to repeat it for Maha and somebody else who was in there, but um, I did some work with some Finnish colleagues, and we talk about argumentation in like the U.S. like all the time, and like we just don't have a word for that. Like what you mean by argumentative writing and this idea that you have to win your point, like there is no word for that for us to translate that to, and that was such an eye-opening like experience for me when connecting through channels like this it was in a little podcast with um, a, a brilliant colleague I have in, in Finland. Um, so there's perspectives do matter. Does anybody else want to hop in here? So oh, Lisa has a comment. Oh. The thing that I found interesting, kind of back to what you were saying earlier, um, talking about the theme, that, and I don't know if it's the streams that I keep picking up on or just what I'm tuning into because it's my interest, it was sort of the shadow IT idea and the DIY idea and the workarounds and the not yetness and sort of all of that is the theme that I keep hearing and maybe that ties into the divergence and I don't know, everybody seems to be sort of trying to find their way around 
the system, <laughs> whatever their system is. Um, and, and that's the theme, I think, that I hear sort mm -hmm. of emerging out of sort of every session. So the, almost the theme is the un-theme. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, <laughs> and, and I don't know if that's my echo chamber because that's my interest or what, but that that's what I keep hearing out of sort of every session I tune into. No, I, I think that's really interesting because I, I think it fits into um, the theme of, of agency because what is do-it-yourself? It's having a sense of agency that you can do it yourself and that you can work around the system. So, yeah, I, I, I think that's that sounds good. Um, and um, I just posted that Audrey Waters just did a, a you know one of her talks that she was giving in South Africa, and it just uh, hit the, her blog today. And she talked about this concept of uh, Californianism, and she was right. And was talking about this ed tech solution that I think Catherine was talking about. That that, that most of these comments are techno solutionism, um, and I honestly I consider it to be her best piece yet. Um, but there's also like this Californianism also goes back to, and I, I see that rooted here through a deep history of the web and original web ideals. So. Even I, which I love her piece, but it was I. There was there's also this thread of Californianism that goes back to like, um, you know that that Brian McCullough calls it, you know, hippie right wing liberalism, mm -hmm. um, and I see a lot of that kind of here as well. So maybe you know California is good and bad, and I think Helen wants to jump in here. <laughs> yeah, yeah, we do. yeah, it's so great, uh, but you know we're on a little bit of a time schedule oh, here. Okay. So. okay. Okay, I said being the uh, the token Canadian in the crowd, so I, I'm I'm kind of balanced between the U.S. and the the Eurocentric, and and we have a have a camp in both feet, and we hear both messages, so it's really nice to be able to kind of blend in and say, okay, in true Canadian fashion, we'll try and balance this and figure out how to make it work because there's this side that says you're going this way, and then the European centric. Uh, people are going this way, and and there is a balancing place for all the all the OER and all of the discontent with tech, and all, underneath it all, you I think the the perspective of keeping the students in the center of it and and understanding that it's it's only about them and what they need to learn. If we can keep that as the focus, then everything else will just evolve and revolve. Yes, I mean, that, yeah, that's a really valuable perspective, and I suppose, like Laura mentioned, you know, the theme of anxiety has come up a lot, and I referenced uh, Richard Hall's work about the university as anxiety machine, and um, I think it's very difficult to provide that, that the learning environments that we want to and the care that we want to when there's so much anxiety on the part of, of staff, whatever you want to say, academic staff, faculty, admin, you know, whatever level you want to talk about, and I think that's, I think that's one of the kernels of of what's happening here, acknowledging that. Yeah, and I, I think the scary part is that it's a big business that that is threatening to take take that over, take that that component away from that human element that faculty want to uh, want to have with that relationship with their students. Yeah. And that's the Bye. Thanks so much. Bye. Bye, okay. everybody. Thank you so much for joining us. Um, so everybody else, that um, you may feel free to hang for a few minutes if you want. I think Maha has to go to the next session. At University um, of Yale University College, um, in the Center for Innovation and Learning and Student Success, we have a strong uh, R&D design and focus and thinking about how are we moving the, lead, the needle in terms of access. I'm going to turn my sound off. Hold on. Okay. There you go. I was probably broadcasting the, the conference. Um, so, is there anything that you, uh, that uh, Lisa or Jennifer or Helen, you want to say um, in closing? Helen, you're still muted. You have to unmute. <laughs> I'm working on it. I think the conference, in total, has really just kind of stretched the, stretched the bar for me, and and you know, just the awareness of of what the struggles are from from beyond my own perspective. I think that's been a, a real benefit for me to be involved in this type of virtual conference experience. Um, and I wouldn't have done it without virtually connecting. Oh, that's awesome. Um, yeah, this is my first time being a virtual buddy. I've joined hang other Hangouts before. Um, but, you know, I really like it. I think I, I'm looking to see, you know, how far we push it. I think what Maha and uh, Jennifer have done mm -hmm. um, 
is awesome. But like, you know, getting sessions online and or just, you know, like us, we can sit here right now um, and and have together an idea and, and you know. Yeah. Knowing, yeah. Um, uh, from my perspective, uh, Allison and Drunas and I are stretching what uh, what is available for adjuncts that can never quite be funded and or reach, uh, especially at a community college level, reach conferences mm -hmm. like so this is our big interest and so the, uh, we have really uh, enjoyed what this has brought to the table. So. Uh I agree. It's it's yeah. You say the adjuncts are the ones that are kind of at the bottom of the pool, and and you know we keep doing what we do without really connecting with others. And this this is a really good way to kind of stretch outside of that. Yeah, for sure. Jennifer. Yeah. You know, a, a lot of times, um, you know, just thinking back to what Laura and Catherine were saying about. Um, you know, the, the sense of dissonance about who is included and who is part of the conversation and who is not. Um, and I think the adjuncts are certainly a huge population that, um, you know, that there, there's a lot of struggle, not only, you know, from the labor side of it, but really um, to how to bring that group of individuals into the higher ed conversation in a meaningful manner because they are contributing so much and it's not being reflected. So um, I know that's something that, you know, it's, it's going on nationwide. Mm -hmm. well, and to know that it's also happening in the, the European context and in the Canadian context and in the Australian contexts and, and you know, um, Singapore and, and and uh, you know, the Middle East, Middle East context, it's, it's not just us, me, singly doing, it's nice to have that conversation across boundaries and across spaces and community colleges and universities and PhDs and, uh, you know, people who are just contract people without the PhD attachment to it or PhDs that are not tenured and those that are. And it's it's that it it opens up the boundaries for all of us, I think, and that's the, that's the really cool thing that's happening. Well, I think really they talked about agency and identity being the words, but you can't have agency identity without power. Um, <laughs> you're like there's the, the, the two are they're, they're unsep they, they, they can't be separated. It's like, it's like it's almost like agency identity power. That's that that's language and meaning making right there. Mm -hmm. um, so and and it was interesting because we didn't see that discontent really in the feeds. I think I saw somebody mention that in Twitter who was watching the show but not with us, and they said, ah. saying, you know what? Um, they talked about how they felt a little bit of tension at the conference, um, but that hasn't really come through as much in the um, feeds, per se. Yeah. And, mm -hmm. so and then it's, but there's been these discussions of open and closed spaces, so then it's like, is it because we're, you know, are we putting different identities? We are definitely putting different identities in all of our spaces, but, you know, seeing that how there's this on-the-ground tension that hasn't played out, I, I found that interesting as well. Are they referring to Slack, where some are in Slack, and that's not an open access area? Um, oh. you know, just, I was both. I'm in Slack and there, um, and you can email. I think uh, Matt Carlson. He'll add anybody to, to the Slack channel. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. But yeah, but let's let's push back on that a little bit because we were talking about the need for the the private and safe spaces and also the open yeah. channels. Because um, I've been talking with some of my other friends. It's like the in thing to do if you're like you know, tech royalties just bash Twitter and say how, and it is, it is, you know, I am a white male, it's a safer place for me than most. Um, but I also think the educational Twitter space is, is, a, is, a, is a different kind of Twitter as well. Um, mm -hmm. And I don't want to see everybody running away from the, what I call the town square into the private, you know, clubs. Um, yeah, yeah. Using the college, oh, and I, I called it kind of like, Oh, go ahead, Helen, go ahead. But it goes back to that risk and care. Mm -hmm. And people who who are risking a lot when they step out and say something in that open town square without knowing that who's going to see it and who's going to hear it and who's going to respond to it and, and in how they're going to respond to it. Um, and, and say Slack spaces or, you know, private messaging in group spaces in, in Twitter um, yeah, it, it, it's a safer space sometimes to say, speak your mind. And well, it goes into that whole, the article that was going around the, the world that never forgets. 
you know, you know, as we mature. But boy, when we're 24 and passionate, that still haunts us when we're 48 and yeah. not quite as passionate <laughs> or exhausted. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> or running for office. <laughs> yeah. It's, um, and there was another one, though. Um, George Kuros just point, uh, did a great post on Medium about the innovator's mindset. And it was about a teacher, though, who had learned just so much. He didn't participate in Twitter, but just lurked. Um, yeah. I'll post a link to that article there. It's, it's, it's a good one to read. So here's an edge. He doesn't get that involved in Twitter, but just as a lurker, his whole teaching process had changed. Um, and so I don't want to just lose that. I think we need all of the spaces. That's, that's you know, it's like you want to have, you, and, and the leadership has to be horizontal, and there has to be ins and ways in and out of these spaces um, mm -hmm. if we're going to have that kind of agency. And, and giving people a, a choice, mm -hmm. you know, setting their own when they're ready, you you Twitter and you Twitter hardy. And if you don't, if you're not ready, then you you set up. As a teacher, I'll set up a, a private space for people to have those conversations, digitally versus face to face. So yeah, it it's that whole uh, self selecting my own readiness. That's a great point. Um, yeah, I, I've never I I don't require social media use in my classrooms. I, I don't I don't feel right. Personally, saying you have to use this this space, yeah. um, so and I try to model it. Nobody's used it. If you look at my hashtag edu106, it's just me. Um, but it's it's mm -hmm. been nice. I've been using tools, new tools that give kids more risk and care spaces, um, like using like the, where they can determine their level of privacy. And I've been really enjoying that. But I worry that mm -hmm. they may not have a choice because they may not have the skills to manage the privacy at that kind of level. So if public's the default, I'm, I worry, am I taking away that choice? Um, yeah. So it's like I almost need that. How do we onboard privacy and public and care and risk? How do, we, how do you onboard care and risk? Greg, uh, how do you feel about, um, you know, for students who want to have some kind of online experience but, you know, maybe are still learning or just, you know, for very real security, personal security reasons, cannot use their real name. Um, do you allow them to use a pseudonym or, you know, how do you kind of navigate that kind of um, middle ground? I have um, three levels of privacy. The one is completely open, the second is pseudonym, and the third is an offline assignment. Um, mm -hmm. So with, with Twitter, what they do is they have to watch a, a, a Twitter chat and, and identify what they saw learning occur and who are the leaders and who were, you know, how are, how are people treated as, as newbies? Um, but they could also, I also provide them, they don't, they can just lurk, or I also have a paper-based transcript of an older chat. So I always give some kind of private offline option to every single lesson. Um, like with Hypothesis, it's a, every t -t tweet is, I mean, every annotation is automatically listed in public domain. Um, so there it's either you can do it with your name, you can use a pseudonym, or you can just type up an outline and hand that in as your assignment. Um, because I, I think you have to guarantee some right of privacy for students at some level. Um, it's just, you know, it's, but I do want them on Twitter, though. I do want, especially <laughs> as, as teachers. I, like that's, I, I work in education. Um, so I, I want them to discover. So I just try to model and play. So what is, um, I think Lisa said she was in the field of um, higher education uh, or in online teaching and higher education. Uh, Jennifer, what is your kind of your field or your island of knowledge right now? Yeah, so um, I'm at the University of Minnesota both as um, a full-time staff member in academic technology and then also as a PhD student in learning technologies. Um, so and actually my interest areas um, are a few different areas, digital literacies, open pedagogy, and then um, agency also. So I tend to think a lot about those three issues, especially being immersed in it all day um, and working with faculty and some of the other, you know, larger institutional issues that come up um, as I'm in a central, um, kind of a central support unit. Well, I, I, if you guys want to see how I, we introduce this stuff a lot to higher education students, these networks, um, every January we run a project called Walk My World. Um, and you can just Google that and find it. But yeah, it's a it's a it's a 
Twitter project, hash slash, half poetry, half identity, half agency, a lot of poems, a lot of pictures. Um, but that happens every January, and we, we do it. Um, it's mainly a lot of college students who are, and we play this idea of how, how does identity get shaped in these, um, these spaces? Um, and, and especially, how do I try on my new identities? Um, and how do I project and get projected upon? Um, and you said it's called Walk, Walk My, my World. world. Mm -hmm. okay. um, and we have, you know, and, and we have people from Canada, Australia, and all over the world, kind of. Mm -hmm. We never, we, I think we were missing one continent last year. Helen, you're shaking your head like you know of it, or you, did you do it? Oh, or? well, I, I, I've checked it out. Oh, there's, have you? There's some, yeah, some, some really interesting stuff there. They said, no, it was very interesting, informative. Yeah. Uh, well, Only because I'm a walker. Yeah, well, that's, and when you guys talked about, like, the, this adjunct, and of course there's time. Time's always, you know, I think we're weirdos in the sense because our, our job is our hobby at the same time. Um, yeah. and, <laughs> in these spaces, let's be honest, like, you can't expect everybody to be sitting there on a Saturday in the office after chasing balloons. I mean, that's... <laughs> that's a hobby. Um, and our, our career, we get paid to learn, in a sense. Not well. <laughs> and some of us, you know, better than others. But we, um, so, and I think that was, I totally lost my chain of thought now. I had a really good point. <laughs> so if anybody else wants to hop in before we, get, we close up shop, um, is there any last words? More passion or insanity. I like that. <laughs> and, and staying connected, I think, it is really key you know that balance that that sand, <laughs> you stay sane because you have a chance to talk to other people and say yeah I'm not so far off the edge I, I'm on the right track and I'm doing some really interesting things for my students sake and I have to learn it with them I have to learn it for them and I have to learn it because they push me to learn it to, make, to be better for them yeah so, so that's my final thought I think we have more uh, there are more things under the sun than we realize, <laughs> kind of whatever the phrase is. Um, I was a freelancer. I worked for six schools at one time at one point, and none of them knew I was working for the others. I created my own income um, independently. Um, I worked where I wanted, how I wanted, when I wanted kind of thing, and I built the career out of it, and then I went to corporate e-learning for a while, and then I came back to community college higher ed. I worked prof dev for University of Wisconsin. I mean, I've kind of done it all and been and seen it in multiple areas, and there are many more like me than anybody realizes who have seen it. I worked in open ed for a while, I and mean, I've done kind of all different aspects of it, and there are a lot of us out there who have hacked our careers together, um, who need to network outside the box, talk about divergence, and we need to make room for those voices as well. And higher ed, the academy, needs to make room for those voices because they're the ones who are on the cutting edge also. And we don't make a lot of space for them. And they really have the ideas and know how to reach those students sometimes in ways that the academy and the mainstream really don't know. And, and they're willing to play and feel for it and, and uh, work on the edges um, in, a, in a much comfortable way, I think, than those of us who are in the day-to-day -day grind. So, my parting thought. <laughs> so, can I ask a follow-up question to you about that, Lisa? Sure. Um, because this is something that, you know, we in our office have had numerous conversations about is really how to reach out to those folks. Um, do you have do you have any ideas, you know, from your perspective, like, you know, again, thinking back to time and how, you know, what is a fair ask for um, adjuncts to contribute their time and whatnot, so. I guess just trying to figure out how to, how to reach people. Uh, really, Twitter was the way I got brought in I got connected with people uh, you know first time I met Mike Caulfield I could not stop calling him at Holden uh, you know because that was how I knew him <laughs> there's a lot of people I know by their Twitter handles um, <laughs> being made to feel welcome at conferences being made to feel like that's an okay place for you to be if you're unaffiliated mm -hmm. that really is the key because you don't always feel like you know those forms are made what school do you belong to well, maybe I don't. Maybe I belong to myself, and I work among many places. So I don't know how to answer those those questions. I don't fit neatly in any box kind of thing. I do now, but I didn't then. So um, 
making that a free place to you know to the open market, so to speak, uh, would would be a way. So, in closing, where can we find everybody on the web? Where's where do you do either your writing or or where's the best place to network with you? Your where should we reach out to you? Uh, I'm at at Chambo underscore online and frogsinhotwater.com. Frogsinhotwater.com. <laughs> Love it. <laughs> I'm my own name on Twitter, H.J. DeWard, and I'm, uh, I blog at Five Flames for Learning. And uh, Jennifer? I'm at J.M. England 03, and I have a very neglected blog, so I probably, <laughs> it's probably best just to reach out on Twitter. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's, that's what we're looking for. Where's a place to uh, find you online? So. We'll have to, you know, make sure we reach out. It was, I had a great time. This is my first time doing it. Thank you so much for, um, and uh, Helen, thank you so much for being the backup. And you, you were such a great team member. Because um, with three kids at home, I was literally like throwing them out the doors as we were about to. I was like, get out of the house, get out of the house. Go to the, you gotta shut up. Up. I've got work to do. Yeah. So it was bye, nice to, to meet you, Jennifer and, and Lisa.